it's really just harmoning your pocketbook. We could say that that and that benched NBA player is his, you know, is his dollar, you know, his, it's his, you know, it's his wallet. Uh, so he's actually just do, undoing what the point of hiring a servant is. The idea is that um, th th that's you're, you're suffering enough as a master because you don't get to recoup your losses now from this slave. That's not a good thing, mm. right? Like we shouldn't be, Paul should not be like calling attention to that as if it's some great thing. Why hello my fellow apes, I hope you are well. Welcome back to the Nightmare of Apologetics. In the last episode, we dived into Paul Copen's absurd defenses of biblical slavery. A father selling his daughter? Oh, how cruel is that? Well no. well, no. To quickly recap, Paul has argued that slavery in the Bible was really more like a mutually beneficial work contract between happy servants and benevolent masters. He goes so far, in fact, as to compare the institution of Israelite slavery with modern NBA sports teams. Think of sports players. They are traded. They are sold. Truly, it is quite the mess. In today's episode, however, we see Paul bend over even further in an attempt to dismiss specific problematic verses. He'll even tell us how God, in his maximally moral way, has disincentivized masters from hitting their slaves. It's really just harming your pocketbook. But while the truth can be warped by apologists like Paul, it cannot be erased from existence. So grab your Bibles, my friends, because it's time to dive back into the rabbit hole to see just how far Paul's depravity goes. And yes, of course, we'll be accompanied by the good doctor once again. Like... <sighs> Before hearing what Paul has to say about Exodus 21, 20 through 21, it's worth reading and appreciating the text for ourselves. Here's the King James Version. And if a man smite his servant or his maid with a rod, and he die under his hand, he shall surely be punished. Notwithstanding, if he continue a day or two, he shall not be punished, for he is his money. So what's the deal here? Well, these verses are essentially a legal framework for how much masters are allowed to beat their slaves. It's stating, hey, if you accidentally kill your slave on the spot, that's a no-no, but if they kick the bucket a day or two later, then, well, how do we know that it was your fault? You're in the clear, buddy. In fact, if anyone's the victim here, you are. After all, that slave was your money. It's really just harming your pocketbook. Now, let's get serious. This verse is not just problematic, it's morally abhorrent. It explicitly permits masters to beat their slaves within an inch of their lives. The only catch? Don't let them die instantly. Otherwise, as we all know, an eye for an eye. But hey, if they die after a day or two, no harm, no foul, right? This isn't just a verse that's difficult to interpret for apologists and theologians. It's a glaring example of how the Bible, of God no less, signs off on slavery. God doesn't prohibit slavery, but rather, and very benevolently, limits how much abuse he's willing to accept being dished out by the master. Put it this way, if God doesn't endorse slavery, then why would he instruct us on how to treat our slaves? If someone tells you how much you can beat your wife, they are implicitly asserting that you can beat your wife, aren't they? Needless to say, verses like these were very, very useful for pro-slavery theists. That's scripture. But hey, maybe I'm wrong, huh? Maybe Paul can put me in my place. Let's see what he has to say. Even if we say that he is his silver, let's say that the servant, well, it's sort of like you're, you're benching a, an NBA player for, you know, who, for maybe some capricious reason. And, you know, of course, the team owner, you, you talk about the language of team owner and, and so forth. Yeah. Uh, he's, uh, he's been, been bought by this team and so forth. And yet you keep him on the bench. It's really just harming your pocketbook. We could say that that, and that benched NBA player is his, you know, is his dollar, you know, his, it's his, you know, it's his wallet. Uh, so he's actually just do, undoing what the point of hiring a servant is. So if you're, if you're going to harm someone, do injury, then you're only harming yourself. You're only harming your pocketbook. And keep in mind too, that we have uh, in that same chapter mention of the servant who's eye is gouged out, whose tooth is knocked out, that in, that in the case of that kind of an injury, that person 
gets to go free. So again, that passage is typically not mentioned when this one is quoted. Mm. Uh, it is all very kind of highly selective. It is all very kind of highly selective. Oh, what a revelation. So beating your human property is just like benching an NBA player. And here I was thinking that it was a gross violation of human rights. You're benching a, an NBA player. But no, according to Paul, it's all just a game of basketball, and the slaves are the players. Who wouldn't want to be part of such a thrilling match, right? Well, let's see if Dr. Josh would be interested in playing for Paul's team. Okay, um, <laughs> so, so two things. Um, <clears throat> So let's just let's I think the best way to do this is to actually just talk about what Exodus 21, 20 to 21 and 26 and 27 are doing, um, because this type of, again, of trying to smooth it out and to make it not sound so bad, will just it'll, it'll be useless once the, the audience knows exactly what the text is saying. So the, the thing that's being dealt with in 20 to 21 of Exodus 21 is the same thing that the, you know, the, the lawmakers in the antebellum South were wrestling with. How do you have a master have the right to physically beat um, his male or female slave uh, in order to motivate them or correct them or whatever, but keep the slave, who's likely a debt slave here, um, uh, almost certainly a debt slave here, from... Uh, uh, abuse and murder. How do we balance these things? By the way, it's something that's in all kinds of ancient Near Eastern law collections, right? This is, this is, and if people are ever interested when I say that sort of thing, one of the appendices in the new book is just bringing together all of the laws in translation from the ancient Near Eastern law collections about slaves and slavery, uh, and then commentary on each one. So, uh, and they're all organized based on topics. So if you want to look at like how slaves are treated, there's a section on that just has all of them in chronological order, including the biblical text. Anyway, so in 20 to 21, it says, all right, look, if you beat your male or female slave and they die immediately, what the law will determine is that you meant more than just moderate correction because a slave would not die ostensibly from moderate correction immediately. However, verse 21 says, if the slave survives for a day or two and then dies, the benefit of the doubt will be extended to the master because, well, wait a minute, maybe, maybe he did just give a moderate, you know, correction, a moderate beating, but then something else intervened. And that's why, because, because if he did mean to kill him, he would have died immediately. And so at that point, there is no punishment. And what Paul is focusing on here is that last phrase, because he is his silver. The Hebrew word there is kesef, and that's what it means, silver or money. You'll sometimes see it translated property, because sort of in a colloquial sense, that's, that's what it is. Um, but what the text is saying, of course, this, if this is a debt slave, which again, most likely is, what the master has done is he's, the, the, the reason the debt slave is there is to work off the debt that is owed. Well, if you kill the slave or if the slave dies, then you, you don't get to recoup your losses, right? And so that's what the text is saying, right? Like you, you wouldn't, the, the idea is that, um, th that that's, you're, you're suffering enough as a master because you don't get to recoup your losses now from this slave. That's not a good thing, mm. right? Like we shouldn't be, Paul should not be like calling attention to that as if it's some great thing. Um, and and this, is, this is the more, maybe the more important part to me is verses 26 and 27, because uh, you know, he, he, he says, wow, they don't, they don't usually talk about this one. Well, I'm going to, and he's not gonna like that I am. Uh, because if you read verses 24 and 25, it's following on this um, discussion about the scenario where two men are fighting and they accidentally hit a pregnant woman. And the pregnant woman um, loses her child, loses her fetus. Um, if, the, if only the fetus dies, uh, but the woman is not harmed, then there's just some sort of like a monetary settlement that's made, right? Wow. However, if... Uh, if the woman is harmed, then the text says, uh, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, 
burn for burn, foot for foot, wound for wound, all that stuff, hand for hand. So it it it, it um, sets up that rule of like lex talionis, right? The the law of um, retaliation. And so what that means, of course, for those that may have not heard this before, if the man puts out the eye of the woman, then she has the right, or really her husband, has the right to the eye of the guy that put her eye out. And what that would mean then is that the guy says, whoa, 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 don't take my eye. I will pay, how much can I pay you for you to not exercise that right to put my eye out? And so now it sets the value of the eye in a really effective way. But what's interesting about 26 and 27 is that it doesn't say, and if a master gouges out or destroys the eye of a male or female slave or knocks out the tooth of a male or female slave, then the slave has a right to the eye or the tooth of the master. It doesn't say that. Because the slave is not due lex talionis. They're not due the law of retaliation. They don't have a right to the master's eye. And that's a pretty significant thing. What they are due is to have their debt repaid, which is far less than they would have gotten ostensibly from having a right to the master's eye. Because putting out the eye is a really significant thing. Yeah, and worth a lot of money. So it shows that the slave is not on equal footing in the eyes of the law to that master. So while Paul was accusing, say, us of being highly selective, you're saying that he is being highly selective. I suspect, so Paul's not like an ancient Near Eastern specialist, right? Paul's not a Hebrew Bible specialist. Paul's, I think his his PhD is in philosophy, if I think. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think. It's no shade to that, obviously, but I mean, like he's he's dealing in Hebrew philology, right? And he's he's and and if you're not trained in that specifically, it can be tough. So he may just not know that, right? He may just not know that about the passage. Um, but that like this this that's why I think, and that's why I wrote this book, right? Um, because. Like, I want people that don't have that training to be able to just go and read it and go, oh, I, I gotcha. Like, that's why it says what it says. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I think this is just highly problematic on Paul's part. What you've just seen is a small clip from my podcast with Dr. Joshua Bowen, which is currently available to all supporters of the channel and will be available to the rest of the world in due course. So, to reiterate and expand on Joshua's critique of Paul, firstly, when Paul says... It's sort of like you're you're benching a an nba player for you know who for maybe some capricious reason he's drawing an absurd comparison equating beating a slave to such an extent that they can't work for a day or two against benching an nba player is a gross oversimplification and false equivalence aside from the obvious issue of physical harm an nba player willingly enters a contract gets paid handsomely and has rights and agency slaves on the other hand lack autonomy they could well have been extorted or even forced into their contract they are property bought sold and disciplined at the whim of their owner female israelite slaves and foreign slaves are even handed down as family heirlooms the two scenarios are worlds apart and yet every time paul talks about this topic not only does he equate slaves with free agents but he seems to forget that only israelite male slaves are afforded the special rights of a contract how can he be so obtuse is it deliberate Or are we to believe that a scholar of his ilk, a champion of Christian apologetics, has such a poor grasp of reality, let alone scripture? Because it is one or the other. Secondly, Paul's argument that It's really just harming your pocketbook. And You're only harming yourself. Is a masterclass in missing the point. Objections to biblical slavery are not born out of economic concerns. They're about human rights and dignity. Hence, Paul suggesting that the main deterrent against mistreating a slave is financial loss is not just simplistic and missing the point, it's morally bankrupt. Put another way, Paul cautioning a master not to hit his slave because he risks devaluing his pocketbook is to refuse to recognise the slave's very humanity. Thirdly, we got this banger. We have, uh, in that same chapter, mention of the servant whose eye is gouged out, whose tooth is knocked out, that 
in that in the case of that kind of an injury, that person gets to go free. But by referencing this verse, he's overlooked the actual issue, that such violent acts against a slave are even contemplated in the first place, let alone permitted by an all-loving God. What are we to seriously take from this? That a smart master, like a smart abuser, must beat his slave in a way that doesn't inflict visible damage? You know, like a broken rib. That way, the community can't see you for the monster that you are. It's all about you, isn't it? Your property, your reputation, your pocketbook not about the slave. Fourthly, the distinction of a good master and a bad master is, in and of itself, absurd. The crux of the matter is the institution of slavery altogether. Whether a slave is treated well or poorly by their master is secondary to the fact that they are, indeed, slaves. Arguing about the degrees of mistreatment distracts from the central moral issue that one human being is owning and controlling another. The statement, a good slave master, is a contradiction in terms. It's like saying a good mass murderer. So, in conclusion, while Paul might be trying to put a fresh coat of paint on biblical slavery, it's essential to see it for what it is, an archaic, morally reprehensible practice that no amount of apologetics can justify. Moving on, let's subject our scholar to more apologetic acrobatics, shall we? This time, Paul shines a light on Exodus 21, 5 and 6, which reads, And if the servant shall plainly say, I love my master, my wife, and my children, I will not go out free. Then his master shall bring him onto the judges. He shall also bring him to the door, and onto the door's post. And his master shall bore his ear through with an awl, and he shall serve him for ever. So, if the slave wishes to stay with his wife and children, then all he has to do is give up his entire autonomy, and mark himself as property for all of society to see. How benevolent, how lovely. Look, he could just leave his wife and children, leave the shelter that he has and walk free, right? How libertarian. This is going to be an easy one for Paul to justify, isn't it? The passage from Exodus 21, that a person who has been working as a servant can actually say, you know, I really love this arrangement. In fact, John Golden Gay says that to be a servant in an Israelite household is actually to be part of the family, and that you could actually love the person for whom you're working and say, I wanna be with you forever. So basically, if you've got the possibility of one running away, secondly, of attaching yourself to someone and being his servant perpetually, this basically guts that whole idea of slavery as an institution, and it really makes it very humane, makes it very compassionate and so forth. Oh, how enlightening. Being a slave to an Israelite was just like a never-ending sleepover party at your best friend's mansion. According to John Goldengay, it's all rainbows and unicorns every day. Who wouldn't want to sign up for this lifetime VIP membership? It's also heartwarming and humane, isn't it? And it really makes it very humane, makes it very compassionate. Sark aside, it's statements like what we've just heard that genuinely concern me about humanity. While there's room for rational disagreement in these matters, Paul's apologetic acrobatics is frankly disgusting. But that's just my thoughts. Let's see what Dr. Josh thinks. So there's a clip from Paul Copan. What are your thoughts? So, a couple of things. He, he, uh, he opens up that clip talking about how there's just nothing similar about slavery in the Antebellum South and what we see in the Hebrew Bible. And this is a real problem uh, that I see with apologists. And it's one that I understand more sometimes than others. Um, but what they're doing, and I talk about this in the book, is they're, they're drawing a comparison between what we know happened in the antebellum South and the laws in the Old Testament or the Hebrew Bible. And that may not seem like a big deal, but what they're not doing to show the contrast is they're not going to the laws that were on the books in the antebellum South and comparing those to the laws in the Old Testament. That's the comparison that needs to be made because what, what they're doing is they're, they're, and they'll say it all the time, right? What do you think of when you see slave, when you hear the word slavery, well, you're thinking about like the movie Roots, or you're thinking about whippings and tortures and all this stuff, because that's what happened in the Antebellum South, but that's not what's allowed in the Bible. And guess what, folks? It wasn't allowed in the Antebellum South either. 
That's what's so scary about this. Like, go read Thomas Morris's book on uh, slave laws uh, in, 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 you know, colonial, the colonial South and, and the post-revolution and the antebellum South. Like, obviously, read, read the chapter of my book that talks about it, right? You can see all the footnotes. But, I mean, really, when you read through the laws, uh, you'll see that they consider the slaves, particularly after you get past the revolution, particularly leading up to the Civil War. Like, the laws on the books, you have these judges, you have these lawmakers that are wrestling with, well, the slave is a human. And a good Christian wouldn't abuse and kill a slave. But, master's got to be able to beat a slave with moderate correction. So what do we do? Right? He got to be able to motivate the slave, got to be able to make him work or her work, got to be able to do this stuff. Mm, okay, so we have to make laws that both provide the, for protection of the humanity of the slave from being abused and from being murdered, but still allow the master to be able to beat them. Well, I mean, we see what happens with that, right? We see what happens when, when the, the law is not upheld or there are loopholes in place or you just, you, 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 the, 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 the fact of the matter is that, like, this is what's so dangerous about this mindset of, like, well, look what the law is trying to do. Well, who gives a fuck? Like, sorry. Yeah, I no, mean, I agree. In a very real sense, who cares? Because what actually happens, right? And this is, this is what's crazy, but you see it the biblical texts themselves. Read through Jeremiah 34. You'll see that, like, the laws in Deuteronomy 15, about 60 to the seventh year release, were just not being followed. Right. And so, like, who cares what the law says in that particular sense from a pragmatic sense? Because they just weren't doing it. Right. And so, like, this is why this stuff is so dangerous. But to, to, to I guess, to, to move on to, I think, the, the main point of what he was saying there was that, um, you know, what, what was it really about? It was really about, like, trying to keep people from being poor and, and, and trying to make sure that people, you know, didn't die from starvation. And boy, what a great deal. You got to leave after only six years of serving, right? Unless, of course, Stephen, unless uh, the, the slave really loved his master and wanted to stay with him. Well, okay, <laughs> sort of. Right. First of all, if we're really going to hold up the biblical text and say, look, only six years and you get to go free. Well, we really ought to be holding up the laws of Hammurabi, because guess what? In the law code of Hammurabi, you only had to serve for three years and you were set free. So, wow, you know, what a what a great deal. Hammurabi, we really ought to be listening to him. Right. I mean, like what? <clears throat> but. You know, it's it's sort of doing a little bit of of uh, uh, you know f f slick movement there, a little, little you know moving moving the hands kind of quickly here to to talk about um, if you if you love your master. Well, yeah, if you look at, at Deuteronomy 15, that developed law, sure, that's that's what it's focusing in on, right? But in Exodus 21, that's not that's not what's talked about at all, mm -hmm. right? That's sort of like a a tacked on to the end concept, right? Really what's being discussed in Exodus 21, two to six is if this guy comes in as a debt slave um, and his master gives him a wife and his, this, this wife and the debt slave have children at the end of the six year term, he can exercise his right to freedom as a debt slave, right? But the wife, the children, they're property of the master. So how does he, if, if he says, I love my wife and my children and my master, right? I will sign. But what does he have to do? I mean, Paul, like, like this is what they just sort of go over. Let's assume, let's assume for the sake of argument that, yes, that the reason that that guy signs up for life to be a chattel slave is he loves his master. Who cares? The law is saying, here's how someone can give up their right to freedom, Here's how they can sign themselves over to be someone's permanent, inheritable property. Hello? Hello? Like, uh. Now, as we did before, let's reiterate and bolster some of Joshua's points. Firstly, when Paul mentions... John Golden Gate says that to be a servant in an Israelite household is actually to be part of the family. He's attempting to equate servitude with family, which is a grossly romanticized view. 
What would you think of me? What disgust would overcome you if I confidently claimed that the British Empire was just trying to roll those disadvantaged cultures into our big loving family? The word family implies mutual respect, rights and responsibilities. And let's not forget that the Israelite concept of wholesome family life as a whole is hardly comparable to the supposed objectively good family life that modern theists subscribe to. Modern theists don't typically have slaves at all, and if they did, they wouldn't ban the female slaves from going outside. Oh, and nor would they see fit to stone their sons to death for not listening to them. Secondly, Paul's statement, You could actually love the person for whom you're working and say, I want to be with you forever, is one of the most oblivious pronouncements I've ever heard. Let's think for a moment of what might convince a slave to relinquish their freedom in perpetuity to their master, because Paul treats this decision as completely divorced of economic, social and psychological factors. To just scratch the surface, economic constraints might limit a freed slave's opportunities, making staying with their master a necessity rather than a choice. The social stigma of being a former slave could hinder social mobility and relationships, and the psychological toll of prolonged servitude might lead to decisions rooted in dependency rather than genuine affection. In essence, Paul has grossly simplified the multifaceted socio-economic and psychological factors influencing a slave's choice to stay. He has no consideration for extortion. Thirdly, there is, again, a glaring omission in Paul's argument, namely the distinction between Israelite males and Israelite female and foreign slaves. While he conveniently highlights the rights of Israelite male slaves, he neglects to mention the perpetual servitude imposed on female Israelite slaves and foreign slaves. And this selective representation is not just an oversight, it's a deliberate attempt to paint a rosier picture of biblical slavery. No scholar of the Bible could miss this discrepancy. It is all very kind of highly selective. Paul is treating his flock like fools, who, rather than desiring an accurate picture of the Bible, or even reading it themselves, are actually chiefly concerned with having their doubts dissipated. And you know what? After studying and confronting apologists for a decade, I can tell you with great confidence that this is, indeed, the primary purpose of apologetics. They're lawyers. Fourthly, Paul's attempt to rebrand biblical slavery as very humane, makes it very compassionate, and so forth, stands in stark contrast to modern ethical standards, standards that theists insist are objective. Today, any form of involuntary servitude or slavery is a no-go, full stop. It's inhumane, unethical, and reprehensible. Let's call a spade a spade. Dressing up slavery as some compassionate relationship doesn't change its core nature. At the end of the day, one individual has dominion over another. It's like calling a cage a metallic living space. The bird inside is still not free. So, in summary, Paul's mental gymnastics to defend biblical slavery is a masterclass in obfuscation. His analogies are absurd, his omissions calculated, and his romanticizing of this abhorrent institution is morally bankrupt. At every turn, Paul distorts, ignores, and contorts to paint biblical slavery as something that it clearly is not, and in doing so, he perfectly encapsulates the modus operandi of apologetics, defend the indefensible by any means necessary. As George Orwell wrote, there is no crime, absolutely none, that cannot be condoned when our side commits it. The truth about slavery in the Bible is plain as day, but apologists like Paul cannot accept it, for to do so would be to pull at the thread that unravels their entire belief system. To acknowledge the immorality of biblical slavery would be to undermine the notion of a perfectly good God. It would reveal imperfections, injustice, and ethical contradictions in this supposed timeless moral guidance of a book. Paul is not blinded by ignorance, but by choice. As Orwell said, to see what is in front of one's nose needs a constant struggle. In his desperation to reconcile biblical slavery with his moral convictions, Paul has abandoned reason for rationalization. He clings to contortion, not truth, and in doing so, he perfectly embodies the dangers of dogma that bind rather than liberate. Ironically enough, he is a slave in his own right, a slave to his fears, a slave to his desires. But we as a society must 
do better than this. We must see things for what they are, not for what we wish them to be. And we must have the courage to speak truth, even when it cuts against the grain of the familiar. Anyhow, as always, thank you kindly for the view, and if you enjoy what we do here at Rationality Rules, then please do consider becoming a supporter of the channel. We could really do with your help. Talking of which, thank you very, very much to everyone that supports the channel. We cannot create this content without you. Lastly, please be sure to check out the links in the description to explore Dr. Joshua Bowen's amazing work. I cannot thank him enough for enduring Paul Copan, and I am really looking forward to publishing our full conversation in a few days or so. Thank you. God, it's just so crazy that I have to say this out loud.